and welcome to Black Oak Baptist Church. Trust and pray you've had a great week. I'll ask you to stand this morning. Our choir comes up. We're going to start our worship service this morning. Begin our worship service. His name is wonderful. How many know that this morning? How many know that he's the name above all names, right? Amen. What a beautiful day he's blessed us with. Every sin, every 
Sometimes in life, it's easy to praise God when you're on the mountaintop. All the glory God does for you, he, he blesses you with. You thank him for it. Never thought about how much blessing and how much truly God would open up your heart to worship. If you thought about the valleys you go through sometimes, right? God takes us in the valleys, but he's right there walking with us. Lo, I'm with you always, right? Thank him for the valleys we walk through sometimes. It'll be the greatest blessings Amen. in life. Amen. Sing with me.
unless you give him a big round of applause this morning. Amen. 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 Brother Tommy and Brother Rocky going to play. Turn around and welcome someone to church. Our visitors, we're expecting to have you, to have you with us today. We ask your blessings upon you today. Jesus kids, they're going out the back door, so if you want to slip out and go to the Jesus kids, amen. Pastor, come on. Amen. Glad you're at church today. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here today. Does anybody have a song on your heart this morning? Special song you feel like you have on your heart before we get into God's Word today? your Bibles with me this morning to Psalm chapter number 13. Am I, am I working today on this mic? All right. I don't have to use a handheld one today. Psalm chapter number 13. That song that we just sung is very fitting for what the Lord has laid on my heart this morning. And it's the truth that all of us go through valleys. We talked in Sunday school this morning that if we were only on the mountain and if we stayed in a state of revival 24-7, we would never grow in the Lord. Wait a minute, preacher. You mean that if, if we were in revival every day of our lives, we wouldn't grow in the Lord? Well, we would grow, but without the valleys, without the dark times, without the hard times, you and I would not grow into who God intends for us to be. I said in the prayer room this morning that I feel, I never know the mission that the Lord's given me. I just be obedient to what he says. But I feel this morning that the Lord has sent me to help the person that is struggling. I won't ask you to raise your hand this morning, but if all of us were honest, there are times in our life where we don't want to put one foot in front of the other. If we were honest, there's times in our life when we can't see the light of day and we don't know how we will walk another mile, how we will keep living for the Lord. Maybe this morning you're in a place of discouragement. Maybe this morning you're in a season of testing and trying and you're wondering, preacher, how can I keep living for the Lord? Can I tell you if you're there, you're in good company this morning. I don't know how many times that I have preached sermons on going through the valley. And Roger, I don't know how many times I found myself in that valley before I could preach the sermon. In Psalm chapter number 13, if you'll stand to your feet, let's honor and reverence God's word today. Before we read these few verses, beginning in the first verse, uh, the context of where scholars believe Psalm 13 fits is when David was running from Saul for his life. Okay, have that in mind as we read in Psalm 13. David said, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemy say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But 
I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I thank you for the valleys of life, Lord. It's been in those places that you have molded me, Lord, and made me, Lord, into who I ought to be. And, Lord, surely today I believe that you're still working on me. But, God, I thank you for every time that I've been in Psalm 13. Lord, I thank you for every moment that I did not know how I would go another way or, Lord, how a way would come for me. But, Lord, I'm thankful that every single time you've made a way. Lord, I'm thankful that every time that I've struggled or that I've had a hard time, Lord, that you have been right on time, never a moment early and never a moment late. Father, if I know anything today about us as human beings, it's that we are often broken people. Lord, it seems as if we fight from victory to victory only to find ourselves living in a place of defeat. I have no idea other than myself, Lord, to know what anybody is facing today. Lord, health problems, financial problems, marital problems or spiritual problems. But I pray this morning, Lord, that you would sit me aside, Lord, just as your servant, and that you would anoint me to preach your word this morning. Lord, that we wouldn't let an hour pass us by and check a box that we came to church. But, Lord, that the Spirit of the Lord would move through this place and that our hearts would be encouraged. Lord, that we can keep going for you, not because of us, Lord, not because we feel like it, but because that you are good enough for us to keep going. Father, I pray that you'd give me unction and that you would preach this morning. And Lord, I pray you'd bind the enemy and I pray that we would be helped and I pray we would respond in a time of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Leave your Bible open. I told you Psalm 13. Scholars believe uh, that it was written when David was running from King Saul for his life. To, if you were just to read Psalm 13 without the context, it would surely mean something to you, but we wouldn't understand the full scope of uh, what David is talking about. If I can recap for just a minute, David, in 1 Samuel 16, you'll remember, as just a boy of a ruddy countenance, Samuel came uh, and he anointed David to be the next king of Israel. Many believe he was around 13 to 15 years old at this point. Uh, Saul did not obey uh, the Lord in one of the battles therefore he rent the kingdom from him David would become the next king of Israel alright I want you to imagine this morning at the age of 15 years old you receive news that you're going to be God's man God's king over God's nation that's a pretty hefty thing to think about uh, but the Bible said before Samuel ever anointed him that the Lord was looking for a man uh, that was after God's own heart uh, and you'll remember in 1 Samuel 17 uh, that David, his father Jesse, sends him to the battlefield uh, uh, for his seven brothers to bring them some supplies that they would need. Uh, and they're all hiding in the trench when David gets there. Uh, and there stands seven foot tall Goliath, uh, a big boy, an uncircumcised Philistine uh, that's defying the armies of the living God. Uh, and David said, men, is there not a cause that you'd lay in the trench as cowards uh, when there is a battle to be fought? Uh, I, may I say this is not my sermon today but can I say if you're discouraged and on the verge of quitting now is no time to lay in the trenches when there is a battle for lost souls out in this world somebody say amen right there uh, and David goes we know the story I'm not preaching it he goes by the brook he gets five stones uh, uh, the old preacher believed he was getting one for Goliath and four for Goliath's brothers uh, and he goes and he throws the stone and faith guides it and he drops Goliath man David is on the mountain how many of you have had a mountaintop experience? Where you felt like you was on cloud nine? Can I say, during the week of revival, I felt like I was preaching from the banisters of heaven. God was so thick in that place. And then when revival ended, can I be honest right now? Y'all pray for me. I'm not complaining, but I feel like I got beat up this week. Amen. You ever been there? Just spiritually whipped. That's where David is in Psalm 13. David goes back and uh, Saul uh, asked Jesse to send David to his house that he would play the harp for him. And the Bible said that an evil spirit would enter Saul and David would just be playing the
the harp and Saul would launch a javelin at his head and try to kill him and then we know that he eventually becomes one of Saul's servants and he sits at the table where Saul is sitting and his heart is knit together with Jonathan Saul's son and then Saul keeps trying to conspire against David and David told Jonathan I've got to get out of here before I die listen to me I'm trying to establish some context that David was supposed to be the next king yet his life was on the line every moment that he was alive he makes a pact with Jonathan if you'll remember first and second Samuel and he says Jonathan I'm not going to dinner tonight and when Saul asked where I'm at you just vouch for me he said I'm going out to the field and Jonathan said after dinner time if my father is still conspiring to find you and to kill you he said go out in the field and he said if the archer shoots the arrow behind you you can come back it's safe he said but if the archer shoots the arrow past you it's time to flee Uh, well the night comes you know the story the archer shoots and it goes past David and David bows down he looks at Jonathan he's leaving his packed brother that they've made and he flees into the wilderness Uh, can you imagine now listen to me I'm talking about a man that was anointed to be king of Israel I'm talking about a man that had a promise from God that he would be a man after God's own heart that would lead the nation but now I'm talking about a man that is running through the wilderness uh, and he's living in caves uh, and he's living in dens Uh, he's sleeping with his eyes open every move he makes Saul makes Uh, if you read your Old Testament Saul was constantly on the heel of David trying to kill him not trying to take him captive trying to take him out that's where we find him in Psalm 13 maybe your Bible has headings above chapters anybody's Bible have that that's good it's it's not inspired though that's inserted by man that's not part of the word of God I'm thankful for a man calls this psalm the deserted soul psalm but I think it was much deeper for that than David. So understanding where he's writing at, right? In different seasons of your life, you would write different things. To understand where he's at, he sings this song. And he says, how long, Lord, are you going to forget me? Have you ever been there if you're willing to be honest? Maybe you walked into church this morning and you said, Lord, I don't know where you are. Lord, in the middle of my struggle, I am praying. I'm trying to get out. I'm trying to get victory. I'm trying to live for you. Where are you? David asked three questions to the Lord. He said, how long are you going to hide your face from me? If we were to be honest, if we, if there are times in our life when we try to pray and we can't seem to find God. There's times when we go to our prayer places and it's like all of heaven comes down and glory fills our soul and we fellowship with the king of kings uh, and the lord of lords uh, but there's times if you're not willing to be honest I'm willing to be honest as the pastor of this church uh, there's times that I go to my prayer place uh, and I seek the face of God uh, and I wrestle like Jacob did at Bethel and I seek the face of God uh, and I just can't seem to find where he's at Uh, disclaimer I'm not preaching that he went anywhere Uh, he's still sitting on the right hand side uh, of the throne of God Uh, Isaiah said that his hand's not too short Uh, that it cannot save and his ears not too heavy brother George that it cannot hear but hear me friend sometimes it is the will of God in your life and the will of God in my life that the old preacher would say the teacher is silent during the test it's not that you're forsaken this morning it's that God's trying to grow you can I say some of the psalm we'll read in a minute about Jeremiah about the nation of Judah sometimes because of our sin. God withdraws himself. If we're not living a life to please God, we're not going to find God in prayer. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But sometimes we find ourselves where David is. We're doing everything right. We're sitting in church. We're sitting in Sunday school. We're going through our Bible time. We're having prayer time. We're having devotion time. We're trying to worship. But it just can't seem like we can find victory. David said, how long are you going to hide your face from me? He said in verse 2, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? Can I ask anybody, are you there this morning? 
Preacher, I don't know where the joy has went, but it's all sorrow. And then he said in verse 2, How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Can I ask you maybe this morning, do you fit in any of those three criteria? Uh, uh, preacher, I don't know how much longer God's going to hide his face. Uh, I don't know how much longer I'm going to feel forsaken. Preacher, I don't know how much longer I'm going to feel uh, the sorrow of this life in my heart. Preacher, I don't know how much longer that I'm going to feel like the enemy has hooked me behind his truck uh, and took me up Wind Rock Mountain just dragging me all over the place and I cannot get victory. We could come to church uh, and we could shout the victory. We could put on a facade. Uh, but if we were honest this morning, all of us are broken people in need of a complete Savior. Somebody say amen. You and me from the pastor to the lay person, from the teacher to the deacon, from the choir leader, Roger, you testify, from the choir member, from the janitor that cleans the church, all of us are broken people who need a complete God. Can I say this is not the first time David has been here. Flip your Bible back two pages to Psalm chapter number 6. At least it's two pages in my Bible. In Psalm chapter number 6, Guess what? David was in the same place. From the context of this psalm, we have no idea where David was. Some believe it was when Absalom came, David's son, and was trying to kill him and usurp the throne. But we don't know where he was. But listen to what David said in Psalm chapter number 6 in the first few verses. He said, O oh Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thine hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O oh Lord, for I am weak. Is there anybody weak this morning? O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is sore vexed. Listen to what David said in a different place. But Lord, how long? Return, O oh Lord, and deliver my soul. And save me for thy mercy's sake, for in death there is no remembrance of thee. And in the grave, who shall give thee thanks? He said, I am weary with my groaning all the night make out my bed to swim I water my couch with tears mine eyes consume because of grief it waxes old because of mine enemies David said in a different place he was in the same season of life preacher where is David he's in the valley may I take you to Psalm 23 David was in the same place and he said I am in the valley of the shadow of death but is anybody glad can I get ahead of myself without getting ahead of myself is anybody glad that David said even in the valley of the shadow of death that the Lord is with me that thy rod and thy staff that they comfort me and they give me strength you know what David was saying in that psalmist shepherd he was saying even when I'm in the valley of life that shepherd would carry that crook in Bible days and the backside of it served as a rod what was that for? that was to defend the sheep from the wolves when they came and the top side of that staff had that crook in it what was that? for when the sheep got out of the fold uh, the shepherd would pull him back uh, uh, David is saying to you and me this morning uh, that when we are in the valleys of life uh, that the shepherd is able to pull us back into the fold uh, that the shepherd is able to keep us close to him and that the shepherd is able to defend off the enemy preacher I got told when I got saved that everything was going to be perfect well quit listening to the TV preacher because that's not true I was told that if I would surrender my life to Jesus, things would get easier. No, they get harder. The Bible said the way of a transgressor is hard. May I say the way of a Christian is worth it. Amen. That old preacher preached payday Sunday. It's coming one of these days. I believe that was R.G. Lee. Uh, he said payday Sunday is coming. But David finds himself in this place over and over again. Don't turn your Bible, but I'll read it to you. I just want to move quick, but I want to establish some more to you. Jeremiah found himself in this place. Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations, uh, and that word literally means to lament or to weep or to cry. We know Jeremiah as the weeping prophet. Uh, and when all of Judah would not heed the word of God, and they were carried away captive to Babylon, uh, uh, Jeremiah spent the entire third chapter uh, uh, lamenting and crying because of what happened. And he even went on to say in chapter number 5, Lamentations. Listen to the brokenness of Jeremiah and see if you can agree with it. He said in chapter 5, verse 14, The elders have ceased from the gate, the young men from their music. The joy of our heart has ceased. Uh, our dance is turned into mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Uh, woe to us that we have sinned. Listen to what he said. Wherefore doest thou forget us forever and forsake us for a long time? Hear me this morning. If David got to a place uh, where he said, Lord, where are you? Uh, if Jeremiah got to a place uh, where he felt forsaken and said, Lord, where are you? Uh, R.G. 
arguably two of the greatest men of the Old Testament, then I promise you that if you are following Jesus, uh, and even if you're not following Jesus, you're going to get to a place in your life where you wonder, God, where are you? Surely Job was in that place. When he lost his children, he lost his homestead, he lost his cattle, his wife forsook him and walked away, told him to curse God. He lost everything. And the Bible said that he sat down in sackcloth and ashes and he wept. Surely he wondered, where is God? Can I say that Jacob wondered, where is God? Early on in the book of Genesis, the last one I'll show you and I'll move on. In Genesis 42, verse number 36, we just went through Joseph on Wednesday nights. You and I ought to know this context. Uh, uh, not only is Joseph gone, but now Simeon has been kept in Egypt. Uh, while Joseph's trying to get Jacob to come, this is what Jacob told his other sons. Uh, he said, all things are against you. Can we be honest in a Baptist church on a Sunday morning? Do you ever feel like all things are against you? Maybe right now in this moment you are in a place of struggle in your life and you are wondering, Preacher, I have no idea where God is. Preacher, I have no idea how I'm going to make it. Preacher, I don't know how I can keep doing this any longer. I'm praying, I'm studying, I'm worshiping, I'm seeking the face of God. I'm serving in my role of church. But I don't know why the trials of life are coming to me. Can I tell you what the devil said to me more, more times than Especially in that moment, you know our testimony when we lost our little baby, where the devil just whispers in my ear and says, where's your God at right now? Maybe right now you're in a place where the devil is whispering in your ear. You're broken. You're forsaken. God has done left you on the side of the road and he's kept going. Maybe you're like the man at the pool of Bethesda and you're wondering in your mind, he was laying there lame. And when the angel came down in John 5 and stirred the water, the first one that got in was healed. And Jesus walked up to that man and he said, would you be made whole? And he said, I've got nobody to get me to the water. Maybe you're sitting in church. And all I know to pastor a church, Jacob, is just to be honest. Maybe you're... Maybe you're coming to church and you're watching everybody else worship. Maybe you're watching somebody else raise a hand. Maybe you're watching somebody else shed a tear. Maybe you're listening to somebody else say amen and you think, why can I not do that? Maybe you're in a place where everybody's getting help and the devil's told you, surely God has left you to die and there is no way out. Friend, for those of us that are raising a hand, for those of us that are shouting, it's because we're just believing God in the middle of you know what the Lord tells me a lot when I come to worship and I don't feel like worshiping? John, he says, just worship him. David found himself in a place. How long is God going to hide his face? How long am I going to have sorrow in my heart? How long will the enemy be exalted over me? Listen to verse number 3 and I'll get somewhere. He said, consider and hear me, O Lord. My God, lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Can I go just one more step further? And I promise I'll show you how you and I can get help this morning. David didn't only say that I'm forsaken and that I'm alone, but David said, Lord, if you don't do something, I'm going to die. Literally, when we translate that. Can I ask you this morning, do you feel in your heart that if God don't do something today, that there's no way you can? Maybe this morning you're sitting in a church in church, and you, if you were honest in your heart and with the Lord, you would say, Lord, I'm at the place where I just want to give up. I'm in the place where I'm ready to throw in the towel. I'm ready to lay the sword on the mantle. I'm ready to hang up the suit. I'm ready to hang up the dress. I'm ready to put my Bible on the shelf and go and live my way. Or I'm ready to give up altogether. Friend, if you are there today, there is nothing wrong with you and you're in good company because that's exactly where David was. If the man that went on to be the best king that Israel ever had apart from the Lord Jesus was in a place where he struggled, Brother Rick, it helps me know, okay, that when I'm in this place, that I'm not forsaken. Can I tell you the thought the Lord put on my heart to preach, and there's a reason I waited to tell you now. He won't leave you there. Even when you're in this place, he won't leave you there. He did not leave David in this place. Would you look at verse number 5 and 6 with me? He said, in verse number 4 first, he said, Lest mine enemy say I've prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I move. But David said, 
but I have trusted in thy mercy, and my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation, and I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. The same thing that David said in Psalm chapter number 6 and verse number 9. He said, the Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. The same thing that Jeremiah did back in Lamentations chapter number 3 and verse 21. He said, this I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. It's of the Lord's mercies that I am not consumed. But thank the Lord, they are new every morning. I would dare to say that all of us have been sitting quiet this morning because at one place or another or maybe right now we are in that place but maybe we can shout for a minute and say that I'm glad preacher I've been in the valley and he's come through before you ought to say amen right there a preacher I've been in a place where I felt forsaken and all alone but I learned that he would not leave me in that place but I need you to see something this morning preacher I just don't know why God's not rescued Verse 5 and 6 was before deliverance came. David did not say, Lord, I'm ready to give up. And Lord, I'm ready to throw in the towel, but you rescued me. No, 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 no. David was in faith. Listen to me. Write this down. Don't let your feelings determine your faith. I don't know when I wrote that in my Bible, but at some point I wrote that in my Bible. You know what that tells me? Other than this week, there's a time that I've been in this valley before. You know what that tells me? That that time that I was in the valley, the very reason that I'm standing here today means that I came out of that valley. David did not let his feelings determine his faith. Listen to me. Prior to deliverance, uh, he said, all of these things have come against me. I'm ready to quit. I'm ready to throw in the towel. But I have trusted in your mercy. Can I tell you this morning, if you're in the place of wanting to give up, you need to trust God. Now, I'm not giving you a theological statement of saying you're in the valley because you're not trusting God. I'm just telling you that in the middle of the valley, God is asking you to trust what He is doing. In the middle of your storm, in the like the song said, in the middle of a time when the sun isn't shining. And can I tell you that I was reading in Warren Wiersbe's commentary studying this week, and he put it this way. He said the sun is always shining, but sometimes the clouds just cover the sun. Can I say in the middle of your valley, I'm not talking about the S-U-N, I'm talking about the S-O-N. He is still shining today, but maybe the valley's just hiding him. And he is saying, child, keep trusting me in the valley. And you know what, David? did because he trusted in God's mercy because he trusted in what Jeremiah said that that mercy was new every morning and that that mercy would never fail can I say that this preacher will fail you can I say that every deacon of this church no matter how good we are they will fail you mama and daddy will fail you husband or wife will fail you a son or daughter will fail you but thank God Jesus never failed anybody glad how sad it would be for us to get in a valley and him just to leave us there. But can I tell you that he won't leave you there. But there's some things you've got to do. So many times in my life, I've had the juniper tree moment. If you're a Bible student, you know what I'm talking about. I've been Elijah under the juniper tree. You know what he said? It's enough now, Lord. I'm ready to die. And so many times the Lord comes, helps me. There was a cake baking on the coals. There's a cruise of water. He took a nap. One preacher said there ain't nothing that a nap and cake can't fix. Uh, uh, but he gave that to Elijah. Some of y'all will get that later when you go home. And then Elijah went right back into the cave. And he said, Lord, I'm the only one that you've got left. So many times I find myself in that place. If you were honest, has there ever been a time you just wallowed in your pity? Has there ever been a, that's a King James word, wallowed. Has there been a time in your life where you just had a pity party? Sometimes Haley will ask me, Matthew, are you having a pity party? And I'll say, yes, and you're not invited. I'm doing it all by myself. You can cry me a river, and I'm going to have a time all by myself. If we were honest, there's times we were there. Brother Corey mentioned in Sunday school, and I like what you said that the preacher said about Revelation 1-9, uh, uh, that John was on the Isle of Patmos, uh, and John had uh, been a martyr almost for the faith. Uh, Nero had bullied him in hot tar. Uh, Nero gouged his eyes out. Uh, Nero couldn't kill him. Uh, so he exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. Uh, and Brother Corey told us in Sunday school uh, uh, that John said in Revelation 1 9, I John him on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God. You know what he didn't do? He didn't have a pity party. He didn't say, I'm in this place because I'm living for God. I'm in this place because I was bold and hot tar. I'm in this place because God's forsaken me. He said, I'm in this place for the plan of the Lord. 
Can I say, if in your heart you are genuinely seeking to live for God and you're in a valley today, you're in that place with a plan. The fiery furnace was God's plan for the three Hebrew boys. The lion's den was the plan for Daniel. Uh, the Red Sea was the plan for the Hebrews. Uh, uh, Mount Moriah was the plan for Abraham. Uh, uh, we can look time and time again in the Bible. Uh, we can read Hebrews 11 of the heroes of faith that they were not high and lofty people that walked on top of clouds uh, and they did everything right, uh, but that they were humble, low down, broken people that were seeking to live for God. Uh, preacher, why does God keep breaking me and breaking my will? Because you can never help somebody else get whole until you get broken yourself. That old song says, I wouldn't be thankful for the mountain without the valley. I wouldn't be thankful for the sunshine without the rain. How could I love the light without darkness? There is a plan for the valley today. But there's some things you've got to do. Preacher, what are you telling me? To quit having a pity party. I'm talking to myself. Quit complaining about everything that's wrong. Uh, we were sitting together, the three preachers, we did this revival last week. And, uh, one of the preachers looked at the other preacher and he was just struggling, sharing his heart, said, I'm having a hard time. And he looked at him and he said, well, tell me something good. Can I say quit telling yourself everything that's wrong and tell yourself something that's good? Remember the last time that God's mercy was enough to bring you to the valley. Remember the last time when you were ready to throw in the towel and God threw it back and said, wipe your face, you're not there yet. Remember the last time when there was no way out, but he made a way. Remember the last time when you felt forsaken and all alone, but he did not leave you there. Preacher, I don't have one of those moments. Raise your hand if you're born again. Amen. That's an imperative. Raise your hand if you're born again. Amen. You've got one of those stories. Because there was a time when he rescued your soul from a place called hell. If that's all that you have to remember, then remember it. If that's not all that you have to remember, then still remember it. Listen to what David said. He said, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. Why? Because I trusted in your mercy. Friend, if you can't trust God in the valley, you won't rejoice in the valley. And then he said in verse 6, I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bound." Hang on a minute, David. You just sung two verses, two stanzas prior that you was ready to die. That if God didn't help you, you were giving up. But friend, when we shift our focus from everything that's going on and we look unto Jesus again, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him despised the cross, endured the shame, and is set down on the right-hand side of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, 3 said, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. When we take our eyes off of our problems uh, and we put our eyes off of the, on the problem solver, when we take our eyes off of our brokenness and we look again to the one that can make something beautiful out of something that's broken, and we declare to say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, I don't know where you are uh, but I'm trusting that you see me where I am I'm trusting that you have the way to get me out and I choose to believe that you won't leave me here that's when we can get there but preacher that was King David surely that, surely that was just a special situation for him how do I know that God won't leave me where I am well, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 5, the writer said, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, Who is he? For Jesus hath said, I will never leave thee, and I will never forsake thee. Do you know what one of the things is that God cannot do? There was somebody that had a booth set up at the October Sky Festival, and we got to talk to them. They were, they were out of town, kind of evangelistic missionary people and they had a, a thing and you opened three doors and it said three things God cannot do well I'm a Baptist preacher I was interested so I walked over there and I started opening the door I wanted to read what God can't do well of course God can't let anybody into heaven if they're not born again is what it said well of course God cannot change Hebrews 13 6 said he's the same yesterday today and forevermore and then the last one said that God cannot lie I've talked to a lot of people that have lied to me but I'm glad that Jesus never lied. 
I can't trust what a lot of people say. Preacher, how do you know that? Because they say one thing, then they say another. I can't trust what I say because I say one thing, then I say another thing. But I'm glad that I can trust what Jesus says because he has never lied before. He told Abraham, I could swear by nobody greater, so I swore by myself that I would never leave thee nor forsake thee. Friend, it ought to help you this morning to know that the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords and the Alpha and the Omega, the Omnipotent, the All-Powerful, the Omnipotent, present, the omniscient one, the one that's everywhere at the same time, that knows everything and that's all powerful, said I will never leave you. Can I digress for a minute? It's not the big man upstairs that said he would never leave you. No, no, no. Don't call him that. It's not the old guy in the sky. No, 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 no. It's the king of heaven's army. I guarantee you in this moment in Psalm 13 that David looked back and he remembered while he was running from Saul for his life and he remembered if God was there when Goliath came against me and I stood against him as a ruddy man and faith got in my stone and took the giant out. Surely David said he was there then and he'll be there now. And if David could come tell us today if he was there now, he'll be there forevermore. Psalm Isaiah 43, I'm almost done. I want you to listen to the first two verses of this chapter. Listen to what it says. The Lord told Israel, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. Why? For I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name, and thou art mine. And when thou passest through the waters, guess what, that's a valley. But he said, I'll be with thee. And through the rivers... I'll be with thee, though they overflow thee. And through the fire, I'll be with thee. I, I'm, I'm adding that phrase. And thou shalt not be burnt, neither shall fled the flame kindle upon thee. Why? For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. What did the Lord tell Moses in Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 8? Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doeth go with thee. And he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. What are you trying to tell me, preacher? That you may be in the valley but he won't leave you there in verse number 8 and he said the Lord goes before you he will be with you he will not fail you he will not forsake you fear not nor be dismayed the Lord told Joshua when he took over as the leader of the Hebrews he said I have commanded thee be strong and courageous why if you're not hearing me hear me now because I'm done preaching be not afraid neither be dismayed for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Can I tell you, he won't leave you there. He didn't leave the three Hebrew boys in that fiery furnace. It may have been his will, but he didn't leave them there. He didn't leave. Brother Travis taught us this morning in Sunday school that he didn't leave Daniel in the lion's den. He didn't leave the Hebrew peoples by the Red Sea. He didn't leave Abraham on Mount Moriah where he was going to sacrifice his only son. He didn't leave Jesus on the cross. He didn't leave him in the tomb. He didn't leave the heroes of faith that struggled, but he brought them through the valley. Can I say this morning, you ought to quit praying, Lord, get me out. And you ought to start praying, Lord, get me. Can I ask you to be honest with the Lord this morning? Are you in a place where you feel forsaken and all alone? Are you in a place where you feel like there's no more help? Are you in the place where you think, you, you maybe, maybe you walked into church and you thought, here I am again. I'm about to go through the motions and I'm going to leave just as broken as I've came. The Lord doesn't always give me any special insight. I'm speaking out of my own mouth right here. But maybe you walked into church and you said, here we go again. It's the fifth time in a row. I've not got any help. The preacher's not preached anything that helped me. Uh, uh, Roger didn't sing anything that helped me. Friends, sometimes that's because we get so focused on our problems that we don't listen to the Savior. And here's the message today that the Lord clearly wants to communicate. If you're struggling, He promised He wouldn't leave. If you're searching for him, he promised in Jeremiah 29 that he would be found of you. If you're trying to find a way out, quit looking for a way out and trust the way maker. If you're trying to make a way out, quit trying to make a way out. And Brother Rick preached it last Sunday night. Just depend upon him and he will get you out. Brother Tommy, I want you to come to that 
piano, if you will, and just play ever so softly this morning. I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes all across the church. I want us to be honest this morning, and this isn't the ending of the service. This is the most important time of the service. And I want us to be honest this morning so that we can get help. It's the only way that David got help. I wonder this morning, I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm not asking you to sign a card. I'm not asking you to stand up in front of all of these people here today. But I'm just asking you, is there anybody here and you're right where David was and you need help? Here's the invitation today. Before we sing, before we pray, I'm asking you to get out of your seat and to trust in His mercy. Right now, in this moment. Preacher, I'm struggling. Well, the Lord is saying there's help today and you can come. I'm asking you today, would you come? Would you trust in His mercy that you can leave this place rejoicing? There's more this morning. If you're honest with the Lord, if you're ready to give up, you're struggling, you're ready to throw in the towel, listen to me, there's help, but there's some things that you've got to do. I'm asking you, would you come get help today? And trust again by faith, no longer how how long you've been in that place, that He's not going to leave you. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you will not leave us in the struggles of our lives. But Lord, I'm thankful that you are willing and more than able to help us and to rescue us. But Lord, I pray that we would do what we need to do and we would trust you. That we would have faith and that we would rejoice. Father, I pray that in this moment, wherever we are on this property, if we need help, I pray we'd get help. But for those of us that are in here, I pray we'd come to Jesus and humble ourselves and to trust in you again. In Jesus' name I do. As we stand to our feet, as we sing this morning, if you need to come, if you need help, would you come? Would you come? I just can't get myself to step out. There's help for you right where you are. Maybe right there, whatever you're struggling with in your life, right now, if you would surrender it to the Lord. If you would ask Him to help you to trust again that you can rejoice and that you can sing. You may.
may be there another week. You may be there another month. You may be there another minute. But I can promise you on the authority of God's word, he's never left anybody there. He won't leave you. Today, there's help for you. You're simply asked. Father, thank you for your word today. Lord, thank you for the help that you give to us. And Lord, thank you that you've promised to never leave us and nor forsake us. Lord, we sung it this morning that we're just pilgrims in search of a city. Father, as we make our way toward heaven, and Lord, we go through valley after valley after valley. Lord, I pray that we would grow in our faith. And I pray that we would become more like Jesus every day of our lives. Father, we love you today. I pray you'd help that one that stands in need. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated for just a moment. I want to remind you about service tonight at 6 o'clock. I want to remind you after service tonight, we will be uh, packing OCC shoe boxes. Is that still correct in the gym? Um, so we need all hands on deck for that. So you come to service and then come down for that after. Um, all women are invited to our uh, the Baptist Women's Day World of Prayer. Was that what those flyers were? If you didn't get one, you can get one from Miss Melanie or Miss Cheyenne on your way out. Um, you're encouraged to invite or bring other ladies with you. That's Monday, November 6th, beginning at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Uh, so you come to that, and the Lord will bless you for it. And you come praying, and I, it's, that was the theme of Sunday school, it seemed like, too. I believe we all need to grow in our prayer lives. And then also, uh, Dutch Valley Elementary School will have their um, chili supper on Friday, November 10th. And they are needing desserts as we normally do. So if you can make one and wrap it, or if you can buy one and wrap it and make it look like you made it, that'll be all right too. And if you can get with Miss Candace about that, she'll let you know when those need to be delivered, okay? All right. How many of you like good news? Well, I guess none of you do. How many of you like good news? Amen. I like good news. Uh, our renovation is moving forward. I'm going to let Brother Roger step up here. Our renovation is moving forward. Our tentative goal right now is to start sometime in January. The finance committee is busy trying to secure all the monies that we need uh, to do that. But we have finally received a rendering. So if you hang on just two seconds and go ahead and tie your shoes because it's going to blow your socks off. All right. The Lord is moving and this just makes me so excited for what God is about to do here. Brother Roger, you come. For that, I, I was going to go, I should have got my phone around the truck, but I didn't do it. Anyway, I turned the screen off because I want you to look at it. Matter of fact, when I showed it to one person, they the first question out of their mouth was, whose church is that? So I hope you're, this is our dream, this is what we've been praying for. And so uh, actually, Brother Kevin has the render, and we're going to have it blowed up, and we're going to put it on the, put it on a board outside. So it'll be out there from here on for you to see, but without further ado, Mr. Eric. Show us the drawing. I don't know if the, the one on the back picture is a whole lot, but uh, you can see everything. That's, that's what we think is what it will look like. The Lord just knows. God just knows the drawing. This is the drawing. This is the harvest. This is what I said. This is what the uh, future will look like. This is what the stage will look like. because due to the lighting, that does not do justice at all to see it. But we'll show it again um, tonight. Yeah, I, I do too. So. Uh, but just to make you hopefully excited for what we are about to do, preacher, it's not about the facilities. That's right. But one preacher said that God uses the facilities to facilitate his mission. 
so we should update the facilities. There's a lot of safety things that are going into this with electrical and HVAC. So this is our, our vision. We voted it in two sun, three Sundays ago, so we're moving forward in faith. I'll be talking to you next Sunday. We're going to do a pledge drive over the next month to secure a little bit more monies to help us to secure the money that we need. So what I ask you today, Black Oak members, if you're a visitor, you're welcome to get in on this, but you don't have to. Uh, Black Oak members, I want to ask you to begin praying for the month of November what God would have you to pledge. I, I factored some mathematical um, things that would help us see what we need as far as the pledge. And may I remind you, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. Brother Bill, how many people are sitting in here this morning? 150 people sitting in here. I know that includes visitors, but at least 100 Black Oak members. If all of us will give what we can, this is possible. Nothing is impossible with the Lord. We have prayed, we've prayed, we've prayed, and we've prayed some more, sought the Lord. This is where we are. Church is in agreement. So I'll be talking to you about that next Sunday. So please start praying now what God would have you to pledge, okay? Let's stand, and we'll be dismissed today. On your way out, you can take a peek. You can see that one better. I'm going to turn the lights back on so nobody falls. But we'll be dismissed. Please be back tonight at 6 o'clock. Brother Corey, would you come close us in prayer this morning?